Great, thanks. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, my name is Randy Schaup, and I want to talk today about moving fast at scale. Um, so you remember in Aino's uh, keynote this morning about laughter, she said a couple of things about effective speaking. So one of the things she said is, I'm supposed to get, make sure that you respect me, right? That's part of it, the ethos. But there's also some aspect that I'm supposed to be self-deprecating. So these are some places that I've worked over the last 15 years, and you can take a guess at which things deserve respect and maybe which things, you know, maybe deserve some self-deprecation. Great. Uh, moving along. Uh, so I want to talk about moving fast at scale. I'm going to talk about four different aspects of uh, what moving fast means. So first I want to talk about high performance cultures. How can we build a culture that everybody's going to participate in that's going to allow us to move quickly? How, uh, next I want to talk about how we can form our organization out of small autonomous teams. The third thing I want to talk about is problem definition. How can we figure out that the pro what problems we're trying to solve and what goals we're trying to achieve? And then lastly, I want to talk about execution discipline. So this is about the processes and practices that we go through as we're actually building our software. So let's start with uh, high-performance cultures. So who in this room has uh, taken a look at this book, the Accelerate book by Nicole Forsgren and others? Great. Um, that's a good amount of people, but there should be more people. So I strongly suggest that you uh, leave the room, go out and order in your favorite bookstore uh, this book, read it, come back. Uh, no, seriously. Um, but this, this book has a lot to say about how to, be, how to build effective engineering organizations. And the thing that I want to highlight in, in the moment is uh, organizational culture. So uh, they identify three different kinds of organizations. So one, which they call a generative organization, is characterized by trust and sharing among the people that are there. So when there's difficult news, uh, people are celebrated. Uh, novelty is celebrated as opposed to uh, suppressed. Um, this is the kind of place that's fun to work, and we'll talk about what that means in a moment. Uh, in the middle is, there is a bureaucratic organization, and I bet some of us have worked uh, in, in, in uh, organizations like this, where it's characterized by standards and rules and processes, and if you follow uh, this uh, mechanism, then uh, that's uh, how we do things here. And the last that you really don't want to work in, but sadly I have experience, is uh, what we call a path organization where it's characterized by fear and threat. So let's talk about what, it, what characterizes these generative organizations, and as a telegraphing to the end message, it's going to turn out that these generative organizations move a lot faster, build better software, and have better business results. So let's talk first about this idea of theory X and theory Y, and this is a wonderful idea with a terrible name. Uh, so, way back in 1960, Dr. Douglas McGregor introduced this idea of theory X and theory Y, and I'll tell you what that means in a moment. What he was, uh, what he was exploring in his book, The Human Side of Enterprise, was leadership's beliefs about what motivates employees. In other words, what, what, why do people come to work? Why are, uh, how can they be motivated? Uh, and he characterized two different uh, kinds of motivation. So one, the theory X style uh, manager, is the person that believes that people are inherently lazy, um, they avoid responsibility, and they require extrinsic motivation. In other words, micromanagement or being told what to do. Um, on the other hand is the theory Y style of leader or the theory Y style of organization which believes that people are intrinsically motivated, they genuinely want to seek ownership and seek responsibility, and they want to perform well. So in a Theory X organization, sort of management's at the top, it's very authoritarian, it's very repressive, very tight control over what people are doing. You can see the management on the top like pushing down on the staff, yuck. Um, whereas in a Theory Y organization, uh, management is on the bottom, being a servant leader, trying to enable and, em and empower the employees. Um, giving control to the staff rather than keeping control for the management, uh, giving responsibility as opposed to taking it. Um, and, uh, and this uh, theory Y style leadership and this theory Y style organization characterizes those generative organizations which, as we're going to see, end up with much better uh, engineering results and business results. Um, the other really important point about high-performing cultures is what's called psychological safety. Who's just heard this term, psychological safety? Oh, great, almost everybody. That's excellent. Um, so uh, I used to work at Google, and uh, uh, Google 
Uh, as you might imagine, measures a lot of things. They also measure, you know, uh, how their employees and other teams are performing. And they did a multi-year-long study to try to figure out what differentiated the high-performing teams from the less high-performing teams. And it turns out that the biggest contributor to uh, the biggest determiner of whether of team success was not uh, how many PhDs were on the team. It was not how long the people had been at Google. Uh, it was what's called psychological safety, or better that the team is safe for interpersonal risk-taking. In other words, I can bring my whole self to work. I'm not going to be made to feel bad. I'm not going to be made to feel ashamed. I can bring all my, my whole self, all my ideas, and I'm going to be respected as opposed to uh, made to feel bad. So I can bring my whole self to work without fear of negative consequences. And it turns out that at Google, uh, this was more important than any other factor in terms of team success. So that's really it really uh, shows the importance of culture. The last thing I want to talk about here is cross-functional collaboration. And in my experience, the best decisions that we make are not made by one person telling everybody what to do, but rather a partnership among uh, all the different people that are uh, involved in the group. Uh, and it turns out that when we, uh, we tend to, when we have an agreement on goals and priorities, it makes it a lot easier for the team to agree on how to achieve those, uh, those goals. And what I've found is, not always, but often, uh, when people are disagreeing, it's not because they agree on the goals and they agree on the situation, but that, that one of them, or maybe both of them, are missing part of the context. Does it make sense? That when we, that when we, that by sharing common context, uh, not always, but more often than not, we're going to end up uh, agreeing on what to do. Uh, and when we don't, then I really like this um, uh, management idea, which originally came from Intel, which is called disagree and commit. And the idea here is we'll have a discussion about what we're going to do. Everybody openly and transparently shares, well, I think we should do A, I think we should do B. Ultimately, we reach some consensus that we're going to do, let's say, A, and the people that uh, argued for B, they say, okay, well, I disagree with the decision, but I'm committed to making it successful. Does it make sense what I'm saying? So we commit, even if I disagree with you know, what the group has come up with, I'm not going to you know, secretly undermine it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit to making it a successful uh, achievement. Great. Uh, so I want to use an example from Google to, as uh, how we implemented some of these ideas. So uh, I, I used to run engineering for Google App Engine, so that's Google's platform as a service. Uh, and way back in tw uh, 2013 when I was working there, we had an eight-hour global outage. So all of App Engine, all, the, all, all over the entire world was down for eight hours. So that was a very unpleasant day, let me tell you. Um, and the reason that, uh, and there were lots of reasons that kind of layered up to uh, that one thing. There wasn't any one root cause. There were lots of different things that contributed to it. But it was very clear that uh, we hadn't been prioritizing issues of reliability and availability as much as we should have. So here's what we did. We uh, got everybody in a room, and we tried... We peppered the whiteboards with all the different things that were potential contributors to reliability issues. Uh, we enumerated all the known things and all the things that we suspected might be issues, you know, a bunch of things that people had in their heads that we hadn't actually done. Uh, and then we ended up, uh, at the end of several hours, sort of consolidating them into eight or ten different themes. Then we, um, we assigned each one of those themes to one of the you know, senior engineers or one of the leads in the, in the uh, room. Typically, people were volunteering for something. And we gave everybody one week to think a little bit more deeply about that particular area, play out the trade-offs and the consequences, and come back with a recommendation of things we might want to do a week later. Um, so then, in, uh, you know, it, it's a week later, and we brought basically the same group of people in a room. Again, I want to make sure, I want to be clear that it's not just engineers, it's engineers and product people and business people and support, etc. Um, and all the people discussed, people, you know, went over the, uh, uh, the uh, suggestions that they had, we discussed those things, and we prioritized them together. Uh, and at the end, we, you know, assigned, we had, you know, a big long list, and we did, you know, started on a smaller number, um, but we assigned people to do, the, to do that work. Um, 
And then we just started implementing this, uh, this reliability program. Um, engineers continued working on those individual assigned tasks. Um, and then uh, there was a, a very minimal effort from management, that was me, in terms of mo uh, monitoring and managing the progress. It basically took me about an hour a week to um, bug people to say, hey, you know, could you please fill in the line on the spreadsheet of the thing that you're working on? Let me know what your status is. And um, we uh, shared that broadly in our, in our uh, group meeting. Um, so this was a very lightweight process around fixing you know, a whole host of issues that have been plaguing us for a long time. Uh, so I'm proud to report that the results were pretty great. Um, so we ended up having a 10x reduction in the reliability issues that we had. Um, other things that I wasn't expecting were all the people in the, in the group felt a lot more ownership around the reliability and around the availability of the platform. People felt now empowered that you know, they're able to make, uh, make improvements in this area. It had a wonderful improvement, a set of improvements around team cohesion and team camaraderie. And when I get together with the, the friends of mine you know, that, um, that worked with me in that group, Everybody still remembers that, that thing. That it, was a, it was a real uh, turning point in the culture of the team that brought everybody together. So it turns out that you know, crises can actually end up with uh, really good things. Great. Um, so that's uh, high performance culture very quickly. Now I want to talk about uh, the power of autonomous teams. So in traditional organizations, like when I joined the industry over 30 years ago, organization, uh, engineering organizations looked like this. So there would be a bunch of idea people, maybe we would call them product managers or business people or analysts, and they would have a bunch of ideas which they would write down, and then they would toss you know, a big pile of you know, requirements over to well-paid typists like I was at the time. You know, so developers, we would furiously type into our editors. Uh, then we would you know, check them into source control. And then we would you know, throw that code virtually over a wall to the, some quality people to make sure that the things that we typed were decent things. Um, those quality people would say, OK, after you know, several weeks, finally, yes, this looks like a legitimate release. And then we would you know, ship our product out to our customers customers who would operate them in the real world. Um, that's a lot of handoffs, and that's a lot of lead time between an idea and something that's occurring in production. And also, I can tell you that the development people weren't super happy with the quality people, the operations people didn't like anybody. You know, so this wasn't, <laughs> this wasn't a, a recipe for a great collaborative culture, nor was it a recipe for good software. So this is what we do today, right? So today, what we the high-performing organizations do what we call full stack teams. So we have idea and development and quality and operations typically in one team all together. Uh, and then uh, you know, another team for another part of the application or our, syst or our system, another team in another part of our system as well. Um, and why do we do that? It's so that it doesn't take us six months or a year from the idea to having something in production. Rather, maybe we can do it in weeks or maybe even days, and we can iterate a lot faster. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. Great. OK. The other key idea for this is that those teams be aligned to the business. In other words, um, that those individual teams aren't like the database team, the front end team, the application server team, but that, that the teams are aligned around some particular business problem, right? Um, and that that team has some clear goals and metrics that actually matter to our customers. Um, and then, uh, uh, again, those teams would have a well-defined area of responsibility. And so if we were building you know, a large-scale system, each team might be responsible for you know, a single application or a single service, or maybe a set of small related applications or a set of small services. And as a you know, pointy-haired boss, as a, as, a, as a leader now, part of my job is to make sure that we're scoping, uh, defining the scope of those business teams in a way that makes sense, so that most of the work that a team does is within that team boundary, and we don't have to like, use another te uh, work very directly constantly with another team and with another team, that teams are mostly able to be autonomous. And I made this number up, but this is kind of what I shoot for when I'm, uh, when I'm uh, thinking about um, whether my my organization is effective. If something like 70 or 80% of the team's work can be done just within the team boundary, then I think I've drawn uh, the team boundary well. If it's 50% you know, or 20% or something like that, then maybe there's an opportunity for me to redraw the team boundaries in a way that make more sense. Great. Okay. 
Uh, so that was a quick tour of autonomous teams. Now I want to talk about um, problem definition. So uh, if you remember nothing else uh, from this talk, I'd like you to take away these seven words. And they are very powerful. What problem are you trying to solve? Uh, you, can use the, you can use this uh, uh, question all the time, and it's, uh, it's hugely valuable. So as the engineers in the room, which I imagine are mo most of you, have you ever had this experience? So you have the idea person, you know, the business person, the analyst, the product manager come and say, could you just please add this button to the application? Really? Come on. <laughs> there we go. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm expecting. This is what we get this all the time. So. Um, Notice what has happened here. This is not a problem, this is a solution. Yeah? So what, let's, now let's try to have a conversation where we figure out what the problem is, and maybe you have some ideas that, maybe the button is the right thing to do, but maybe you have some ideas uh, where uh, you, you could th think of different ways of solving the problem. So the way I like to respond to this, uh, this kind of thing is to say, hey, can you just give me five minutes or 15 minutes or half an hour and just walk me through the problem that we're trying to solve? Um, and I have found universally that that conversation back and forth with you know, the product person or the business person is hugely valuable for me because now I understand what I'm building and why I'm building it, but it's also really important for them. Now, why would it be important for them? It's because the value that we bring to that conversation as engineers is what I like to call disciplined problem solving. So a bunch of us, uh, if we've trained as engineers or at least have uh, worked in, in, in industry as an engineer for a while, we have um, developed this problem solving uh, methodology, right? We, we look at a big problem, we try to break it up into smaller problems, we try to uh, get rid of the extraneous stuff, try to get to the core of it. All these things are, are the, the, mind, the engineering discipline or the engineering mindset that we bring to that conversation. Um, and you know, not everybody has that. Like, not everybody has that training or that practice of doing the discipline problem solving. So in my engineer brain, here's what I, uh, here's what I, when somebody says this, my engineer brain says, okay, well, I'm sure that person thought very carefully about the problem that we wanted to solve. They thought about the five or 10 different ways we could solve the problem. They thought about the trade-offs uh, of those different things. And then they, they, um, they uh, said that the easiest thing that we could do or that would, be, that would give us most value was uh, adding the button. Does anybody think that that's actually what happened? No. <laughs> no. But that's our job to make it happen. Does it make sense of what I'm saying? So that conversation that we have back and forth with our product partner or our business partner is not to you know, make them go away. It's not, that, it's not to say, I don't want to do your button. I don't want to solve your problem. It's that let's use both of our brains or all of our brains on the team to fully understand the problem and come up with a solution that makes the most sense. And, help, and, and we are doing a service to that business person or that product person honestly, uh, by helping them think through in a very disciplined way, you know, that problem that we're trying to solve. The other thing that we need to do in that conversation is something that I call, not, not I call, that is called the curse of knowledge. And so this is a, a, a common um, uh, fallacy that we all have, um, and it, it goes like this. If I know something, I assume that you know it too. Does that make sense? So the other, pro you know, the other thing that engineers need to do as part of that conversation is get all the trade-offs that you have implicitly in your head about, oh my God, if we add that button, it's gonna have this problem, uh, or gosh, there's a much easier way to, uh, to solve it if we do it over here, or actually maybe that functionality already exists uh, and you know, the business person didn't know that. But the, the key thing is that we have, because we're in the code, we know all those options and all those trade-offs and all the implications of the decisions, and we need to not assume that the person that we're talking with also understands all those things. Does it make sense? So it's part of our job, like it is your job <laughs> to make sure that as that, if part of that conversation, you're letting people know that. Does it make sense? Like adding this button over here, it seems like it's really easy, but it's actually gonna be six months of work and it's gonna have all these downstream terrible consequences. And you know that, but it's your job to make sure that the other person knows that. So we all together, again, have common context and ma can make a well-informed decision about what to do. Does it make sense? Great. 
Okay, the other reason why we want to uh, refine the problem very clearly is this, is that building the wrong thing is almost one of the worst things that we can do in software. And if we really uh, clarify the problem, uh, we will be much less likely to build the wrong thing. Um, so uh, if anybody has, uh, anybody who's read this book, um, 2003, called Lean Software Development, fantastic book, incredibly, um, prescient, like incredibly uh, far-seeing. So this book is you know, 16 years old now, and you would read it, and with, with the exception of the code examples that they use, it, looks, it reads like it's something that was written in, 19, in 2019. Amazingly uh, forward-thinking. Um, and uh, uh, Mary and Tom Poppendick identify the seven wastes of software development, and the number one waste is building the wrong thing. So again, to the extent that we can clarify the problem that we're trying to solve up front, the less likely we're we're going to be building the wrong thing. Okay, if I still haven't convinced you that we should think carefully about the problem, uh, I'll give you another argument. Um, so Charles Kettering, who used to head research at General Motors in the United States, has this to say, which I think is so brilliant. A problem well stated is a problem half solved. Right? So just simply by going through that discipline problem-solving exercise with our business partner and helping to clarify in great detail what problem it is that we're solving, we're, we're almost writing the code as we do it. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Like we're, we're understanding very clearly what we're trying to achieve and it makes it a lot easier to, uh, to achieve it. Um, anybody who's done any uh, mathematics, so I have a mathematics degree, I'm sure a bunch of you do too as well. Um, modern mathematics is not about solving equations, it's actually about formulating a problem in a way that makes it easy to be solved. Does it make sense? So when uh, Andrew Wiles uh, finally um, proved, whoops, um, when Andrew Wiles finally proved Fermat's last theorem, uh, you know, hundreds of, uh, uh, thousands of mathematicians over hundreds of years had tried to prove Fermat's last theorem. Um, he proved it, but how did he do it? He did it not by solving a bunch of equations, but by spending seven years thinking about how to uh, formulate and reformulate the problem in a way that he could apply modern mathematics to this little part of it or that little part of it or that little part of it. Does it make sense? It was all about how to state the problem in a way that made it easily to be solved. Great. So the last thing I want to talk about here is um, our job is to solve problems uh, and only sometimes do we solve problems by writing code. So it's perfectly okay to, af as we have that conversation with our business partner, to realize, uh, wow, you know, maybe the way to do this is not to add more software, maybe we could just, you know, change the business process itself that we're trying to model or something like that. So when I used to work for a clothing company called Stitch Fix in the United States, uh, one of my teams built software for our warehouses. And so we would have lots of conversations with the uh, leaders of the warehouse about how better software that we could build for them. And they were wonderful partners. And several times we, we said, well, you know, you want us to change the application to do this, what if you just switch the assembly line so you did you know, this part before the other part? And it was like, wow, we could do that. Does it make sense? Like our contribution doesn't, mean, doesn't necessarily mean that we need to write software as long as we solve the problem. Great. Okay, so uh, the last uh, section I want to talk about here is what I like to call execution discipline. So making sure that we build our software in a, you know, in a sort of disciplined way. So, um, Traditional organizations tend to do something like this. And I will say openly, I've, had, I've led lots of teams where we approach problems like this. Well, what do I mean? So probably all of us have um, a big backlog of things that we want to do, and hopefully that backlog is prioritized. So you probably have like a set of prioritized things that you and your team want to do. And almost certainly that list is longer than you have time to do it, right? So as a consequence of having more things that you, you have more things that you want to do than you have time to do them. So as a consequence, you need to prioritize. Okay, great. So now, we, so now let's imagine we have five people on our team and we have five or maybe more than five things to work on. So it would seem like an obvious thing to do is like, all right, well, I have five people. Let's work on five things in parallel. 
And in this, in this uh, you know, made-up example, let's imagine that each of them is about you know, four months of work to get completely done. So I'll just you know, start everybody, and we'll produce, 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 and then you know, four months later, maybe we'll shift some software. Um, I think we can do better than this, though. Uh, and so, you know, I asked you to remember those seven words, what problem are you trying to solve? If I could ask you to remember four more, uh, I would ask you to remember these four. So, fewer things, more done. What do I mean? So instead of doing all five of those things in parallel and putting one person on each of them, let's imagine that um, we, you know, we take the very top priority feature, that number one priority, and maybe we put two people on it. L let's assume that, you know, the feature is we can actually put two people and you know, they're able, they'll be able to be productive. Um, so we'll put you know, two people on feature one because that will make that feature you know, go maybe twice as fast. Um, we'll put two people on feature two and then we have another person we can do feature three. So this looks better, right? Because now um, we've done the two highest priority, you know, we've done the three highest priority things before we've done priority four and five. That's pretty good. Um, also, you know, we've, uh, we've shipped these things in half the time. That's good. So now we've we've delivered value to our customers, you know, in half the time rather than uh, you know four months later or whatever. Um, uh, and that looks pretty good. But let's see, can we do better? Well, what if we did something like this? What if we thought a little bit ahead of time and tried to think of incremental pieces of value that we could produce along the way? Uh, and it might take us a little bit longer to do that, but. Um, but what if we, you know, broke that big, you know, feature one up into smaller chunks and we released, you know, the first part of it and then the second part of it and the third part of it uh, and then the fourth part of it. Um, so now notice that we have, uh, we've produced value to customers more often, so produced more along the way. Also, we've given us the opportunity to potentially learn. So maybe when we get to, I don't know, 1C, we realize, you know what, we don't need 1D, 1C is enough. Or maybe we realize that, you know, feature one's not that great at all. Uh, this actually isn't pr producing the value for our customers that we were expecting it to, um, so maybe we should shift to something else. Does it make sense what I'm saying? And the, iter the iterative development here is giving us that opportunity to learn along the way. Well, so the other thing um, uh, that this is resilient to is something like this. So who has been working hard on something that took them a long time, and then uh, somebody else, not you, has decided to change the priority and the thing that you're working on? Yeah, let, let the record show that almost every, that every hand went up who was willing to, you know, <laughs> you know uh, get out of their stupor there. Um, but yeah. Uh, it is common, it is not a rare case, it is the common case that business, thing, business priorities will change for lots of good and valid reasons. Um, and so the wonderful property of releasing incremental pieces of work where you're done, you know, not after four months, but you know, done with that thing after let's say two weeks, um, you have still provided value and you've still made the world a better place even if there is a you know, higher priority thing that comes along later. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's summarize a little bit about what we just did here. Um, notice that we just reinvented ag agile development from first principles, but that's cool. Um, so we have developed, we've delivered the highest priority things first. So notice in that very beginning thing where we had five people and we worked on five things at once, we were essentially treating the highest priority thing and the priority five thing exactly the same, right? But in this, in this model, we're actually saying, you know, priority one and two deserve, you know, more resources and we should put more against them. So we're delivering the highest priority features first. We're delivering the full value of those features earlier. So, you know, in our first example, we delivered them in two months rather than four months. In our second example, maybe we delivered incremental pieces of value every two weeks, let's say. And, and in all cases, um, the benefit that we would get by delivering something now is worth more than the benefit that that we would deliver if we delivered it later. Uh, we're delivering incremental value along the way instead of everything all in one go at the end, so that allows us to learn. Um, and also, um, it's likely that we're delivering value more efficiently because if I have, I have found, just like that rubber duck we saw, I found that having a partner working with me on a particular uh, feature um, can be really helpful, right? So when I get stuck, I can uh, work, with, uh, work with my partner and she can tell me the things that I'm missing and maybe I can unblock her when, when she's blocked, that sort of thing. 
Does this make sense? The other, uh, and I guess the other core idea that I want to offer here is um, if we've worked and worked and worked on that four month long feature, um, notice that we have provided exactly zero value to our customers until the four month mark, right? It doesn't matter how hard we work on something. It doesn't matter how much effort we put into it if it doesn't ship. So if, if that's the only, I mean, it, since that's true, we should be thinking constantly about what can we do in our own personal development process, what can we do in our team development process to make sure that we're delivering incremental pieces of value along the way. Because by definition, you know, something that we haven't shipped to customers has provided exactly zero value. Okay, um, who has heard this? We don't have time to do it right. Basically, again, everybody, except the lazy people. Um, so we don't have time to do it right. Um, here, is, here is the response that, that I like to use. Um, do we have time to do it twice? Because that's often the choice. And I'm going to be a little more subtle than this in a moment. But... Um, uh, Often, if we do something that isn't good enough, and we'll talk about what I mean by good enough, we're gonna have to come back around and do it again. And interestingly, so I've worked in a bunch of small startups, uh, and it, interestingly, this is maybe counterintuitive, but often the more constrained that we are in terms of time and resources, the more important it is to get our things done. Why do I mean that? It's because when I only have a very small development team, I don't have time to come around, you know, if, if I was trying to work on, you know, one feature, I don't have time to go around and uh, produce one, a new feature and then fix five other features that I only halfway implemented. Does it make sense what I'm saying? So when we're constrained, it's, it's more important that we focus and be very clear about the small number of priorities that we're working on and making sure that we get them done. So, when, so now, when I say get them done and do it right, what do I mean? So I don't mean doing all the possible things and making it uh, as perfect and never needing to be changed ever again. But what I do mean is um, kind of along the lines of minimal viable product, um, thinking about it as a minimal viable feature. So what is the minimal amount of uh, uh, software that I can produce that will produce a good amount of customer value um, and is done. Like it's done there. I can leave it. I can leave it aside, and maybe I'll come back later to make it better. But it's not uh, unfinished. And so, when I say a minimal valuable feature, a viable feature, what do I mean? I mean, let's try to build one great thing or like one reasonably strong thing instead of two half-finished things. So, um, how many of us? carry uh, mobile phones in our pockets, basically everybody, right? So whenever, uh, so I'm sure when you last updated the operating system on your phone, uh, I, how many people said, wow, there are 57 new features in you know, iOS 13, that is awesome, said nobody. Um, instead, you tend to be interested in, a, in you know, two or three features that have value to you. Does it make sense? The quantity of features that they produce in, you know, iOS 13 or whatever, um, is not is not important. It's the quality of those things. It's it's the it's the solidity of the future of the few features that you actually care about. So it turns out you're that you're actually doing better by your customers, not by producing more features, but by producing a smaller number of better ones. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that the definition of done here is not. It's perfect, and I will never have to change it ever again. Um, instead, it's trying to uh, find those uh, the 80-20 rule of what's the what's the minimal amount of value that I can provide now that provides the most uh, the most benefit. And when, not if, I have uh, prioritization decisions about what to put resources on, um, I always want to uh, think about how can I reduce the scope of the thing that I'm working on rather than re reduce the quality of it. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Cool. Um, so, uh, in working with one of my teams uh, recently, so here, what you know, we we made our own definition of done, uh, which I just wanted to share with you guys. So, 
the definition of, you know, our definition of done for a particular feature is, you know, the minimal viable feature that would, you know, uh, solve the problem that we're trying to solve in the simplest, most straightforward, most minimal way. Um, we want to make sure that we have automated tests to make sure that we don't break things going forward. Um, we make sure that thing is actually released to production because if we haven't released it to production, it doesn't matter how many tests we have or how uh, how much effort we put into it. Um, we want to make sure that that you know, it's released to production but actually turned on for users, so that feature flag is flipped on. And also, we want to make sure that it's uh, sustainable for our team so that it's actually uh, monitored. And you may want to add a, a few more to this. But it's very important to me to be very clear in your team about what does it mean to be done with something. Because I've had so many conversations with engineers that uh, I work with. Oh, are you, you know, you're working on the XYZ thing. How's that going? He said, oh, I'm done. Uh, well, is it tested? Oh, no, I haven't written the test yet. Okay, you're not done. Uh, great, so you're, uh, you know, the next day, like, okay, are, you know, how, how are you going on that thing? Oh, I'm done. Uh, is it released to production yet? Oh, no, it's not, uh, we haven't released it yet. Like, okay, you're not done. Uh, you see where I'm going with this. So, like, it, we need all of these things for it to actually be sustainable and to provide customer value. Great. Uh, so, um, uh, we talked about these four things. So we talked about a uh, high-performance culture. We talked about building organizations out of autonomous teams. We talked about problem definition. We talked about how important it is to define the problem that we're solving, to have those conversations back and forth with our business partners, to make sure that everybody understands all the trade-offs of the decisions that we're making. Um, and then finally, we talked about uh, an incremental and a sort of continuous delivery approach to uh, execution. So. In case you might think that this is sort of an intellectual exercise, that this you know, matters just within engineering teams but doesn't matter to the broader business, um, that Accelerate book that I mentioned to you um, has done a great set of studies around what characterizes you know, those high-performing organizations and what differentiates them from the low performers. And it turns out that the elite, the highest of the high-performing organizations, do 46 times more frequent code deployments. So maybe they're deploying multiple times a day instead of you know, maybe once a week or once a month. Um, the lead time from commit to deploy, so when I'm finished you know, writing my software until it's actually deployed out to production, is 25, uh, 2,500 times faster. Um, the change, so this is about speed. Now about stability. So they, are, they have a seven times lower change failure rate, by which I mean the, the times that I uh, release something to production and that I have to you know, roll it back or do a hot fix or do a repair or something like that. So changes are one-seventh as likely to uh, fail. And uh, last but not least, they have a 2,600 times faster time to recover. In other words, when there is actually an, uh, an issue uh, or an outage in production, it takes them you know, 2,600 times uh, less to, uh, to solve the problem. So this is pretty good, right? This means that those practices that we talked about um, actually make a big difference in terms of these engineering metrics. And we're able to deploy things faster, uh, and we're able to deploy more, uh, more stable and more, uh, more solid systems. Uh, but the other thing which I want to leave you with is at the same time, it's not just these engineering metrics, but it's also the business metrics. So again, those same uh, organizations are two and a half times more likely to exceed their business goals around, you know, profitability and market share and productivity. So anybody who says, you know, engineering processes don't matter or architecture doesn't matter, like this is why it matters. Does it make sense? Cool. Well, thank you very much for your kind attention and please use the app to rate it. <laughs> <laughs>